Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Science Storytime. Today, we've got a really special episode of our Build It Week all about space. Because we can't get to space until someone builds something to get us there. So, it looks like it's time to get my antenna on so that we can all be the scientists together. I have two really awesome books that we're going to read today one really fun experiment, and then I'm going to share pictures from my very own visit to the Kennedy Space Center to see a SpaceX launch. Now, spoiler alert, a lot of SpaceX launches have, uh, they get something called scrubbed. Not scrubbed like they're getting washed for the day, but scrubbed meaning something isn't going quite right which means that for the safety of the crew and the rocket, especially the astronauts in the rocket, they will um, delay that, um, that launch. Now, there is a possibility for that to happen today, but we're still going to celebrate it. It's the very first crewed space launch, and my friend did point out that this doesn't sound right. And when I say crewed, I mean like a space crew. NASA used to call this a manned launch, but now we call it a crew because we know that astronauts don't have to just be men. So we're going to get ready for the crewed space launch. So if you're here watching today, uh, make sure that you comment where you're watching from so that I can make sure that all of my supplies and things are working. Um, I haven't heard from anyone on Facebook yet, so if you're watching on Facebook, make sure that you uh, say hello. And I do see that I've got some Instagram fans, EDMS Sylvia, hello, thank you so much for joining me. We've got two awesome books, and we are going to start with a book called Roaring Rockets. Then we'll read um, one of my cousin's favorite books, Pete the Cat, Out of This World. I never heard of the Out of This World Pete the Cat, but I've seen Pete the Cat's Shoes book, which I do love a lot with my cousin Dean. So hopefully he'll be tuning in as well soon. So here we go. Is everybody ready to launch? Well, I almost forgot. To start today's stream, I thought that we could have a ceremonious uh, seven rocket launch. So on Monday, I taught everyone how to make these straw rockets. So I made a bunch of them. And by a bunch, I mean seven. And we're gonna set them all off in honor of the astronauts that are going to go to space today or sometime this weekend. So, here we go. Every space launch starts the same way and that is with a countdown. So, I need a big countdown backwards from five. Make sure you count down with me. Five, four, three, two, one, one, two, Three, four, five, six. Oh, it looks like we must have launched, uh, lost one rocket. And you know what? That's a pretty good success rate. I'll take it. So I hope that SpaceX is just as successful today in their launches. And now let's start with the book Roaring Rockets. Okay, and as usual, if you're on Instagram and you'd like to see the storybook pages, tune into my Facebook page. My Facebook is B-E-E, -E, Be The Scientist, www.facebook.com backslash Be The Scientist backslash live. Okay, let's start with Roaring Rockets by Tony Mitten and Ant Parker. Roaring Rockets. 
Wow, already it looks like they've got a lot of equipment in their uh, car there. Wow, rockets have power. They rise and they roar. This rocket's waiting, ready to soar. And when you go watch a space launch, you'll learn that you can only be at the very closest three miles away. And even when you're three miles away, you'll be able to feel the ground shake and feel the heat from the rockets on your face. Rockets carry astronauts with cool white suits, oxygen helmets, and gravity boots. So this is the astronauts, and they have to go up a really tall elevator to get to the top of the rocket. Then they walk across this uh, plank like uh, entrance with all of their gear. So it looks like our mouse has the spacesuit and a sampler shovel. Our bird has some space boots. Our rabbit has a helmet. And on the inside, they also have a lunar lander. Whoosh! The countdown is finishing. Three, two, one. Action! Blast off! The journey has begun! And there they are, strapped into the rocket. Now we're going to learn a little bit about how rockets work in a little bit, but this fire that you see coming out of the bottom of the rocket helps to propel it up by pushing down. Rockets have fuel in great big tanks. When they're empty, they drop away. Thanks! And this is an interesting um, idea for the future of spaceflight. Now, SpaceX has been able to show us that we can reuse rockets, but I don't think we can reuse those fuel tanks. And when those fuel tanks fall off, so does a bunch of space trash. Most space companies don't really want to talk about that because that's not really something that they're proud of, but they also haven't figured out how to avoid it quite yet. Up in space, you're really light, so astronauts have to strap themselves in very tight. And that's true. That's because the gravity here on Earth makes us really used to staying on the ground. But there's different gravity in space. Not quite zero gravity, but much different, meaning there is nothing pulling us towards the bottom of the rocket ship. So they have to keep themselves strapped in, otherwise they'll float around, which sounds pretty cool to me. Rockets explore. Through space they zoom, reaching as far as the big round moon. And the, all the Apollo missions worked on the moon. Our very first uh, uh, American astronauts that landed in space, or actually astronauts, period, that landed in space were our three astronauts. We had Buzz Aldrin, we had um, uh, Neil Armstrong, and we also had Michael Collins, the often forgotten third astronaut. Michael Collins was in charge of staying in the spacecraft, so someone's got to do it. Out comes the lander with legs out ready and fiery boosters to hold it all steady. So here's Michael Collins still in the rocket while the lunar lander and the other two, Neil and, um, uh, Neil and Buzz, would be down on Earth. Or I'm sorry, on the moon. Rockets take astronauts out to a place that strange and wonderful, silent space. And the reason they say it's silent is because for us, sound travels through the air. And there is no air in space. It's just nothing. It's really weird to explain. So that's why they have to wear their space helmets to make sure that they can still breathe. But it is very, very quiet up there. When the Apollo mission landed on the moon, they planted an American flag. Although, from what we understand, that flag would just look white today, basically from getting a sunburn or radiation um, where it faded the flag. 
I don't know if anyone's made signs for their windows. I know I've made a few rainbows for my windows. And I've noticed that the ones that I made back at the beginning of March are already really faded and need to be touched up to become bright again. Moon mission over. The lander is left outside. We're back in the rocket for the long return ride. And I didn't point out, but you can see uh, Earth all the way back here. And from the moon or from Mars, Earth really just looks like a small little blue marble in space. And it really makes you think. That's where we live our whole life. We have all of our birthday parties on Earth. We eat all, all of our meals on Earth. And astronauts are some of the brave explorers that change that. Where astronauts have celebrated their birthdays in space. They've eaten in space and they've even gone to sleep and go to the bathroom in space. So again, there's our fuel tank falling off. There's still the lander here. And when we first went to the moon in 1969, we left a bunch of supplies up there. Supplies that some of it is garbage, but other supplies that can help us do science experiments. In fact, there has been a laser experiment going on from the moon to the Earth to find out the exact distance. And from this experiment, we learned that the Earth, or I'm sorry, that the moon is moving away from the Earth three centimeters a year. Three centimeters is really, really small. But when you talk about movement of a planet or a moon, that's a lot. Rockets re-enter in a fiery flash to land at sea with a sizzling splash. The helicopter carries the brave crew away. Let's give them a cheer. Hip, hip, hooray. And when astronauts land back on Earth, especially after being in space for a very long time, their muscles aren't very used to moving around and carrying them. So usually they don't have the strength to climb out themselves and they'll need to be lifted out and carried into either the helicopter or onto the um, boat. And they usually try to land in the ocean because that's a really big target to hit. Most of our Earth is water. And then, ooh, I love this. It's got pictures of rocket bits or different things that help us go to space. Gravity boots help to keep us on the ground, but there is not a lot on the moon. So boots are worn that grip the ground and stop uh, you from floating off. And the interesting thing about the moon is that the ground or like what you would call the soil or dirt up there is called regolith. And it's actually really, really powdery and fine, almost like a talcum powder or baking soda. And there's magnetic pieces of it. So when we uh, go into space, the interesting thing that they did not know would happen is those magnetic pieces of regolith were breaking down those rocket boots. So once we went there once, we learned that if we want to go out into space, we need to make sure that it can really help to control uh, all of that sand. When you go to the beach, you know you bring a lot of sand home with you. And you don't want to bring that regolith back into your space shuttle. That is your safe space. The lunar lander takes astronauts down from the rocket to land on the moon. You can think of the rocket as your minivan. And your minivan will keep going around the moon, orbiting it, while the lunar lander can be you running out of the car to your destination. Then, when you're ready to go back, the lunar lander, um, I believe, well, they said they left the lunar lander. So I wonder if then they land the rocket, everybody gets in, and then they lift it again? Or if somehow the lunar lander goes back up to the rocket. I think the rocket might come down to them, actually. Um, an oxygen helmet. We need to breathe oxygen, but there's none in space. So astronauts have to carry their own supply, which flows into their helmets. Then we've got the fuel tanks. These hold the fuel, which makes the rocket go. And then the command module. 
just this very top part, this black part here. This is the part of the rocket in which the astronauts travel on their way to the moon. Most of the other parts of the rocket fall off afterwards. The end. Wow, that was a great book. I really enjoyed that. And I thought that it was kind of cool that they seem to have, um, let's see here, they seem to have copied it from the very first moon landing. Now SpaceX, they're not going to the moon, but they are going up into space. And I'm not sure exactly what the goal of this mission is. That's something that we'll have to research together. Now, the next thing I want to show you before we read our next book is the different stages of a rocket launch. And I found this on a great website called sciencing.com. Oops, okay. So um, these are the stages of a rocket launch. The first thing you have is the primary stage. And that's the very first rocket engine that's engaging that provides the initial thrust to send the rocket up. The first stage is much bigger than the, than the next stage because it not only has to transport its own weight, but it also has to transport the weight of the rest of the rocket. So this is where the most fuel comes in. Then we have the secondary stage, and that's when the primary stage has fallen away. So that's those, uh, the fuel. Then the next rocket will engage to continue the rocket. The second stage is much less work, since the rocket is already traveling at a very high speed, and the rocket's weight has decreased because they've already dropped that fuel. Then, if the rocket has additional stages, the process will repeat until the rocket is in space. Then, last but not least, they have the payload. And the payload is the astronauts and whatever materials they're bringing. Once the payload is in orbit, the rocket's final stage falls away and the craft will be maneuvered using smaller rockets whose purpose is to guide the spacecraft. Unlike the rocket engines, these maneuvering rockets can be used multiple times. Wow, that's really interesting. So if you want to learn more, you can go to sciencing.com or you can also go to nasa.gov. nasa.gov has some really awesome resources for grown-ups and kids alike. Okay, and now our second and last story of the day is Pete the Cat, and I'm going to dedicate this to the Kanawalski boys, although I'm not sure if they're here, but they'll watch it eventually. Let's see how we can make this bigger. I'm using a different program because I really wanted to make sure that I got this book. So I'm going to try to shrink this a little bit. There we go. Okay, so here we go. Pete the Cat brought to you by my Kindle library. Pete the Cat, Out of This World by James Dean. Oh, hey, James Dean, that's the name of my cousin, Dean. It is a great day. Pete the Cat is going to space camp. Whoa. Oops, sorry everybody. Let's see here. Um, I don't love how this looks, so I'm going to adjust it back to how I had it with the full page. There we go. Okay. Um, Pete meets his bunkmate, Glenn. As they unpack, there is an announcement. Welcome, space campers. Please head to the classroom. Your mission begins now. Time to suit up, says Pete. He and Glenn put on their uniforms to race to class. There are so many cool things to do and super neat stuff to see. Astronauts Tom and Chris talk about the trips that they've taken, and they give a sneak peek at a future space trip. It would be totally rad to go to space, says Pete. And Pete's pointing at a map of the sun 
the Earth, and Mars. It looks like he's missing Mercury and Venus, though. The campers find out what it feels like to be an astronaut. They go in the Zero Gravity Challenge. That makes you feel really queasy. I got to go on one similar to that in uh, Disney World in Epcot, and I did not feel good for a few hours after that. They ride in the rovers, and these rovers are currently on Mars, but they ride themselves. They're robots. They even build rockets. Pete's rocket flies very, very far. Way to go, Pete, shouts Glenn. And then it looks like our third astronaut cat friend, his name is Salty. Next stop is Mission Control. We have some very exciting news, says Tom. Our next flight leaves today. We're going to the moon, and we have room for more. Pete, do you want to go? asks Sally. That would be awesome, says Pete. And there's 10 minutes and 5 seconds left until launch. Now, in the real NASA, you don't get invited 10 minutes to showtime. You know that you're going to take this mission years in advance because it takes that long to practice and get ready. It's time to buckle up and settle in to the space capsule. So everybody, wherever you're sitting, make sure you sit all the way back. This is how astronauts sit. They have to brace for impact. And then it starts to wiggle because the rockets are turning on. So let's wiggle in our seats. And now we're gonna count down five, four, three, two, one, lift off. <sighs> Their ship speeds, their ship speeds through space. They blast past the satellite and even spot a comet. And a space satellite is a machine uh, or piece of equipment that humans put up in space that can help us see the Earth. So if your grown-ups use a GPS on their phone or as a separate console to help them make sure they don't get lost, that's because someone had to put that in space. And there's Earth far away. Tom and Sally have a rockin' surprise for Pete. His guitar! He plays a groovy interstellar song for them. Missing Control listens in. And there have been astronauts who play instruments in space, which is really interesting. One of my favorite astronauts, Chris Haddonfield, got to play Space Oddity by David, uh, by David Bowie, and he played a really great cover where he was floating in space. I bet David Bowie never expected that. In no time at all, they arrive on the moon. They are ready to explore. The astronauts collect rocks and map out the moon's surface. And this is why we went to the moon, to learn more about it. We're not quite ready to go there to live yet. That would take a lot of planning and a lot of work. Although that is the plan for Mars, eventually. On the moon, they wanted to study to see how the moon got there. How did it form? And also, um, what kinds of uh, geography is there? Or what is the moon made of? Is it made of cheese? We learned it's not. Remember, it's made of that magnetic regolith or magnetic sand. Pete has a very important job to do. He straps on a jetpack and heads towards Mars. He takes tons of pictures. Now, in real life, you would need an actual rocket ship because it would take about seven to eight months to get to Mars, and you wouldn't want to just have your suit. Oh, no! Pete lost track of time, and the moon is far, far away. He has to make it back to the ship before it blasts off. Pete, you know you can't go traveling by yourself in space. Phew! Pete made it back in the nick of time. The astronauts head home, and there's time for a few more tunes. So it looks like as they're blasting off back to Earth, they still... Ooh, excuse me. I'm not even tired. Uh, <laughs> um, once they go back to Earth, they'll sing all those songs, and they'll land safely back on Earth. 
Pete sure knows how to make an entrance. And this is a little bit different from the rocket that we learned about before. This one looks more like an airplane with a parachute on the back to slow it down once it gets to space. Pete's trip to outer space was out of this world. Still, he's psyched to have his feet back on solid ground again. Rock it on, Pete! Wow, what a special book. As a reminder, if you're tuning in on Instagram and you want to go back and see all the pictures, you can head to Facebook after this and see all the pictures of my storybooks. And now I want to show you some of the pictures that I took when I went to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and tried to see a SpaceX launch. So this is the photo album that I took and I went with my family. My family loves space, especially my dad. My dad always wanted to be an astronaut when he was younger and now he's an engineer. That means that he helps people all over the world to get compressed gases, just like things that are used for space, but also used in hospitals, construction, and things like that. Engineering is a really important part of what NASA and SpaceX does. So I want to show you what this was like. This is a picture when you first come into the Kennedy Space Center. It's set up as kind of like a little bit of a museum and a little bit of an amusement park. When you first walk in, you see the big letters that say explore, and that's one of NASA's mottos. Then you just are absolutely humbled by the size of these giant rockets. This is me and my family in front of the NASA sign. They call this the flying meatball. And something that's interesting is that all of these little stars that are on this logo, you think that they might just be random, but actually NASA adds a star every time that there's a mission. So if you have a NASA shirt back from the 70s, it will look different than it does today. This is my dad and my mom and my sister Carly. I was very excited to see all of these rockets. They are just humongous. And I was standing pretty far away from them, so they kind of look the same size as my head, but I promise you they were much bigger. Then we got to talk to a real astronaut, Don Thomas, about living and working in space. Don Thomas lived in the International Space Station, which is this right here. International means that many countries cooperate and work together to keep that up in orbit. They do many different space experiments up there, and they learn what happens to the body when you're in space. I got to ask, uh, my, me and my dad asked a few questions, and I'm trying to remember. I asked um, what the best kinds of questions that young kids ask the astronauts, and he said that they always wanted to hear about how they went to the bathroom. And if you want to learn more about that, check out NASA.gov. They've got some interesting information on how people use the bathroom in space. Then, as we went to explore the Saturn, which is the most giant, humongous rocket there, this is what we saw. A quote from Carl Sagan, the sky calls to us. And Carl Sagan was the first host of the show Cosmos, which now we know uh, is revived and hosted by Neil deGrasse Tyson. It may have been one small step for me Neil, but it was a heck of a big leap for me. And that was from astronaut Bruce McCandless, the first person to fly the MMU in space. And the MMU at the time was the name for the spacesuit, which now we call the EVA. And basically, a spacesuit is designed to be your own personal spaceship. So you should be able to survive um, I believe it's 12 to 24 hours just in the spacesuit. And they need to wear the spacesuit if they want to go out and fix anything. Now we're on our tour of the NASA, NASA launch sites. This is the V 
AB, or the Vehicle Assembly Building. Again, because of perspective, it looks kind of small, but let me show you how big it is. This is where they build their rockets. So think about it as NASA's garage. Did you know that the inside of the VAB has been redesigned to support NASA's new space launch system and the commercial space industry? This is where Elon Musk will be launching his rockets from, the same place that the very first um, uh, crewed ship to uh, the moon launched from. And this is how big it is. The VAB, by volume, or how much stuff you could fit inside, is actually three and a half times the size of the Empire State Building. Whoa, that's big. I think even King Kong would have trouble climbing that. Then, to get even a better idea of how big it is, you can fit... Um, Oh, 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 this is about the lift. So the VAB's crane, which is a construction vehicle that helps to lift things up, different parts of the rocket, it can lift 47 elephants. Elephants are huge and so, so heavy. But everything that goes to space has to be really heavy and strong too. So they need to make sure that they can lift that up. Okay, this is what I thought was coming up. Now, this is the size of inside of the VAB. It would take 250 billion ping pong balls to fill the VAB. And I thought I had a ping pong ball right here. Where did it go? Oh yeah, here it is. So there's one ping pong ball. Now imagine, 299 billion more. I don't think I could fit that many in my apartment, but I'm gonna send this one into space using my marshmallow launcher. Oh, it's going, going, gone! Wow, that's 791 times the population of the United States. And that statistic must have changed because I went there in, I think, 2016, and the population has only grown from then. This is the, um, uh, uh, sorry, I'm having a brain buffer moment. This is the Mission Command Central that they remade to look like it was during the launch. So each one of these little areas is a desk for someone to sit at. There are hundreds of people that had to work together to get those three men up to the moon. And any space launch, there are hundreds and thousands of people that work hard to make the parts, to do all the math calculations, make sure that the astronauts are healthy and safe. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was pretty cool. And I'm pretty sure that this is a recreation. I don't think this is the original, but they did leave some of the jackets on the back of the, um, on the back of the chairs. And then they've got all the different time zones because people had to work together from all across the world in order to get this to happen. Then, I thought this was really interesting. When we went to go see the Saturn V, um, my dad said that he remembered watching this, the astronauts get into a van to go to the rocket because those launch areas are really, really far apart. You need to drive in order to get to each one. You can't just walk. And once you have your spacesuit on, you don't want to have to do a lot of walking because it's pretty heavy. So when you go into space and the gravity is significantly decreased, it's not quite as heavy. So this is the van that they use to transport the astronauts. Here it is. This is one of the giant rocket boosters. And it's not the Saturn V. That one's orange, and I'm not sure if I got a picture of that in this album. Um, but this one is a uh, five, six, seven, the Shura Elise Cunningham seven. Oh no, I think all of these signs are actually all different ones. 
so I'm not sure exactly which one it is. Now, remember when we talked about the stages? It's listed here. So this is stage one, this part of the ship. And I'm sure that there were other stages listed on there that we couldn't see. So this is the module that the astronauts came home in from the moon. They went in there and do you see how it looks kind of burnt up? All of that is because when the rocket comes back down, that capsule is going so, so fast that the friction between the capsule and the air creates fire. So they need to make sure that that capsule is fireproof. You would certainly be able to roast a marshmallow on it. And then this little hatch door is where they came out. This is a lunar sample. That's a rock found on the moon. And it was estimated to be 3.7 billion years old. Whoa, that's old. Now, something really interesting is that each astronaut suit is made custom for that astronaut because you don't want to have to deal with things that don't fit exactly right. So these are the hand casts of the Apollo astronauts. We've got Neil's hands in the front, Buzz's in the middle, and Michael Collins in the back. And this is so that they can make gloves that fit exactly right. Now this is before there were tons of screens and iPads, they used good old um, paper and uh, like typewritten notes. It's called the Go No Go cue card. And everyone's really excited about space and sending rockets into space. But the one thing that's important is to make sure that you know for sure, 100%, that everything is working the way it's supposed to be working. So the astronauts would go down the list and check and make sure that everything was a go or see if it's a no-go. So this is what they're going to be doing today if the weather is nice enough for them to be able to launch. Here's the go, no go a little closer up. And you can even listen to the transcript of what they sounded like when they were reading all of that. It is really, really interesting. Then I thought this was funny because it kind of looks like a pooper scooper. It's actually a lunar scoop and a lunar sample scale. So they could pick up the rocks with this and then they would hold them on the scale, kind of like a luggage scale, to see how heavy it was. Then, uh, again, this is another, this is a, a checklist for the rover. So that's where they actually went down onto the moon from. And a pen light. So they didn't necessarily have a whole ton of computing power, so they needed to bring some older fashioned things up there, like a light to see what you're reading. So here's another thing that is used, uh, a lunar sample bag dispenser. So that's where you would put your lunar sample once you weighed it and you observed it. This is the camera that was used on the moon um, for, oh, let's see here. So this one never made it onto the moon, but this camera, an RCV television camera, was on the Apollo 7. And Apollo 7 wasn't the only Apollo program's first crewed mission, but it was also the first time that the American audiences could see the astronauts. And they um, drove uh, by and they took videos of the moon and sent it back to Earth. It was just the peak of technology at the time, but now it's really just a very blurry picture. And then, oops, I kind of gave you a spoiler alert. This is when we were sitting and getting ready for the launch with all other people waiting. And we got our space suit, SpaceX shirts then. So we're all sitting and waiting and we knew it was going to be a little while. We wanted to get there and make sure that we got a seat in the bleachers. I see now that this little girl behind me was not amused. And we ended up sitting there, I think, for maybe two or three hours. And we were listening to the mission control and they were doing that go, no go checklist. We couldn't hear everything, but there was someone that was repeating 
things to us in a, in a loudspeaker. And it was pretty clear that there was something not working with the engines. And you don't want to take a risk because all of these astronauts' families are watching and you don't want anything bad to happen to them. It's always, always better to wait and be safe than to hurry up and launch. So there is a chance that today's um, uh, launch might not happen when it's supposed to at 4.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I heard that in Florida, the weather isn't that great today. But my family and I had the best time just sitting and waiting. We were joking around and talking. My dad was just living his dream. He really, really enjoyed it, and so did I. Although I was disappointed I couldn't see a rocket launch, I was really excited to just even be there. And this is my face after we realized that the launch got scrubbed. Scrubbed, again, does not mean taking a bath. It means that they need to start all over another day or another time. And you can see the sun is already going down. I put my shirt on because I was only wearing a little dress. So that was nice, and I love this shirt still, nice and soft. This is what the view was from where we were watching. Again, we were three miles away, and the um, rocket looks really small from here, but again, it is humongous. It is so, so big. I can't understate that. We were the closest. Oh my goodness, why am I? Oh, excuse me. We were the closest that we could possibly be safely, but if you find yourself in Florida on a launch day, you can always go to Cocoa Beach, which is uh, an area that you can go to for free without reservations. My mom had to make reservations in order to go on to the SpaceX um, viewing area. And this is back at the hotel. Pretty much everything around the Kennedy Space Center is all about NASA and space. So this guy was just sitting in our uh, lobby of the hotel. So that was all about my trip to the Kennedy Space Center. I loved it. And I'm searching around for some of the um, resources that I collected. I know that I came home with a really fun NASA activity book, so I'm gonna see if I can find that and post some of the images. And now I just wanna show you something that we made in a previous stream um, when we read about the Magic School Bus. This is a solar system map that is scaled to distance. And I wanna show you just how far away all of these things are. So right here, you see this yellow line, which is the sun. Then Mars, or I'm sorry, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all pretty close together. Then the asteroid belt. Now, even still, to get from Earth to Mars, which looks like they're right next to each other, takes seven months. And then all the other planets are really far away. So we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and I don't like to leave Pluto out, so we'll call it Pluto and all the other dwarf planets at the end. So if you want to learn more about space, about the SpaceX launch today, I encourage you to ask your grownups to take you to nasa.gov on the computer. There's a lot of really fun resources there. And to end our stream today, I've got a very explosive and fun experiment that we're gonna try out. This is one of my favorite experiments that I used to do at my old job. Let me make sure I don't get tangled up here. Okay, so I'm just dragging over Here is my launch tray. For this experiment, if you want to make your own rockets, you'll need a container with water. I like to use warm water, but you can experiment with any kinds. You're going to need Alka-Seltzer, which is medicine for your tummy, so make sure that you ask your grown-ups before you use it. And you're going to need some sort of container with a push cap. So I have these old um, film roll uh, containers and 
they snap on and they snap off. So you don't want anything that's screwed tight, but if you can pop it on and off like a Pringles lid, then that would work. So I have multiple rockets here because I know that sometimes rockets don't always go the way they want we want them to. So because of that, I always like to set off multiple. And I always make sure that my tops fit before I explode them. So I'm gonna put them all out. And then I'm gonna stick this, my American flag for good luck for our launch. And I'm going to number my rocket so that you can guess along with me. Let's see if I've got, yes, I got a Sharpie here. Okay, so we are going to do it like this. Let's see here. Uh, all right, so we've got number one, number two, number three. I'm writing upside down. Number four and number five. So I want you to guess which one you think is gonna go off first. So now, how we actually get these to go is by using equal and opposite reactions. So in order to do that, we're going to use the gas from the Alka-Seltzer. Okay, just adjusting my Instagram view there. Okay, now we're ready. So I like to put in the water first. I'm gonna pour about a third of the container with water. And I always like to do more than I want because sometimes one or two will not work. Okay, so our water is filled up about a third of the way. And now for each one, I need anywhere from a third to a half of a capsule of my Alka-Seltzer. And Alka-Seltzer is really easy to rip apart. So I kind of like to go all out. So I'm gonna use a half of the tablet. So. I'm going to set up the tablets in front of the caps so that I can drop them in around the same time. Okay. So each one is a slightly different amount. We definitely have number five has the most Alka-Seltzer and I think either number two or three has the least amount of Alka-Seltzer. So now I'm gonna drop the Alka-Seltzer in. I'm gonna put the top on, shake it up, and then put it upside down. When the Alka-Seltzer goes into the water, there's going to be bubbles that come out. Those bubbles are filling up the, um, and bubbling up, which means they're taking up more room inside of the container, pushing on the cap. Because the cap will be facing down, the actual rocket is going to go up. And I need to make sure that I have my safety gear on. So let me get my safety goggles. Now, one important thing about this is you do not want to put your head over the rocket at any time. Got it? Got it? Great. Okay. Here we go. Now, they're not all gonna go off at once, but everybody, I want you to write in the comments which rocket you think is going to explode first. Will it be number one, number two, number three, number four, or number five? And without further ado, here we go. We're going to set them up. I'm gonna set them up from five down to four, so this can be part of your prediction. As soon as I drop it in, I can already hear it bubbling and fizzing. You want to make sure not to spend too much time capping it. Woo! Oh, four. Oh, woo! 
five. <laughs> we already went off. There we go. Here comes two. And one. So let's see. Is it two or one that's going to go first? I don't know. Oh, it sounds like we've got a leak. I think on number two. Woo! Number two just went off. The leak was actually from number one. Woo! Oh my goodness. I took my goggles off too soon and I got splashed in the face. That was my very first 100% success rate. Uh, hey, Elon Musk, do you need another Rocketeer? Because I just went five for five. So folks, wow, what an exciting day it could have the potential to be. My name is Be The Scientist. I hope that you really enjoyed today's stream. I hope you learned something new. If you learned something new, if you're excited or you're more prepared for the rocket launch, please feel free to donate to my PayPal or my Venmo. It is not expected, but it is appreciated for this laid off educator. Uh, make sure you tune in on Friday for our last day of Build It Week. And before uh, I sign off, it's time for our goodbye song. So long, farewell to you, my friends. Goodbye for now until we meet again. So long, farewell to you, my friends. Goodbye for now until we meet again it's been great to play and read together in the hive but now it's time to say goodbye so long farewell to you my friends goodbye for now until we meet again Ooh, I can taste the Alka-Seltzer on my face. Bye, everybody. So long.